Hello, my name is Keith Hodge, and here to talk with you a little bit today about anaerobic digestion process modeling in SWOLF. What we're going to cover today includes just a quick overview of the anaerobic digestion process, what it is, we'll get into some reactor configurations, and talk about mass flows through an AD system. We'll cover some of the biogas beneficial use possibilities and some of the options for digestate management. Then finally we'll, we'll look at some illustrative results from this process model. So anaerobic digestion is essentially a biological degradation process in the absence of oxygen to produce biogas. So we have organic matter uh, such as food waste or grass clippings and uh, microorganisms are in the absence of oxygen uh, and with with water converting that organic matter into carbon dioxide and methane and the combination of those two gases is what we refer to as biogas. The biogas can be useful for uh, energy production the, the methane inherent in the biogas is uh, energy rich. There are also nutrients in the digested matter that comes out of the reactor, uh, and that's a function of what's going in. Uh, also, there's potential to use the solid material coming out of the digester as a soil amendment. So the objectives of anaerobic digestion include energy recovery from the biogas and landfill diversion, which is important from a global warming perspective because by handling the organics in a way that we're controlling the methane emissions we and using them beneficially, we are avoiding emissions from a landfill that would otherwise potentially just go to the atmosphere. These quick degrading uh, organics such as food waste and and grass that uh, release methane before a cover and gas collection system is put on. So the secondary benefit that we get out of this is using the digested solids. Um, it, that again does depend on the feedstock, what's coming in and the value of what's coming out. But um, it's can be can be like a compost product. So in a larger solid waste system we are here and as you can see anaerobic digestion can uh, receive organics potentially from a dedicated organics collection system or potentially through a mixed waste MRF and uh, you get a soil amendment out of it and residuals go either to a landfill or uh, through a thermal processing step. From a process modeling point of view, we have user inputs that define the anaerobic digestion process model. Then the incoming waste materials are, uh, are run through that process model and we get uh, three main products coming out. The contaminants, recovered energy, and recovered solids and nutrients. And at the same time, we have direct emissions calculated, fuel, electricity, transportation use, and costs all coming out of the model, and those are fed into the larger, uh, larger S-Wolf system. So what are we talking about when we say organic matter? Uh, we're looking at yard waste, food waste, soiled paper. Uh, those are three items that fall under the category typically of municipal solid waste. Outside of MSW we may be talking about biosolids, ag wastes, or um, maybe some industrial processing wastes that are um, that could be organic as well. So in SWOLF we we have these components that we count as having a methane yield or potential um, potential feedstocks for an anaerobic digester. Uh, these are our defaults and um, it's possible to add other materials but um, the way the way 
SWOLF as a whole is set up is that emissions are allocated to each waste component. So uh, other waste components uh, such as maybe the ag wastes or industrial waste that we talked about before could be um, could be user defined and emissions calculated and allocated accordingly. But in this case we see here that um, the grass clippings and food waste are the perhaps the most important or the primary feedstocks when it comes to anaerobic digestion. The numbers that we're showing here are ultimate methane yields. Uh, these are our default numbers and um, just want to talk a little bit about that. Um, methane yields indicate how much methane if all the uh, all the material is degraded all the way how much methane could you get out of it and um, there's also a relationship there with um, how much of that is actually degraded but we'll talk about that in a little while I'm not going to spend much time on this slide uh, but I want you to see on the the right column all these numbers there's a big range from about 180 uh, getting close to 500 on what methane yields could be so I'll just say that it's important to get as good as an idea as you can uh, of the the feedstock that you have when it comes to reactor configurations there are four overarching design choices that define the type of anaerobic digestion reactor you have is the system wet or is it dry based on solids content uh, that has to do with material handling and so on is it uh, single stage versus two stage the uh, methane production process is really uh, four phases so are you designing a system that handles that all in one tank or one container or in in two separate tanks uh, mesophilic versus thermophilic that's the temperature range uh, that you're operating in and that impacts the stability of the system but also potentially the rate of gas production and then of course continuous versus batch feed um, do you have a pipe that is constantly pumping in new feedstock or are you um, maybe several hours every several hours or even every several days um, adding adding uh, adding new feedstock to your reactor so in SWOLF how do we handle those configurations we model them as um, from a black box perspective meaning that we're not modeling every specific detail we're not getting down into the microbial kinetics and and explicitly modeling those things that's um, that's beyond the scope of what we want to handle in SWOLF um, there are models out there that do that but we're looking at this from a management point of view so the way we uh, the way we handle this is we represent any configuration uh, if there is available performance data. So our defaults are based on a system in Toronto that's a wet single stage mesophilic continuous feed system. And um, we have performance data from that and from other systems and uh, use those, uh, those data points to uh, help, help guide the outputs from the model. So mass flows in the system. Uh, we, we do a mass balance on some, but not every element that's going on here. Uh, the key elements that we track, um, or the key, key flows that we track, include water, solids, then volatile solids, carbon, and biogas. So a couple key inputs when it comes to uh, modeling the mass flows through the system. Uh, the moisture content of the reactor is a critical one and that imp impacts how much water you need to add for example uh, also look we look at uh, circulation in in the system itself and perhaps the most important is the properties of the incoming waste uh, in terms of volatile solids uh, moisture content and uh, methane potential those types of things uh, that is really the the key driver of uh, the mass masses coming in and their and what happens downstream in this diagram we see the mass flows through a typical anaerobic digestion system in this case the numbers represent mass uh, which includes solid liquid and gas and 
um, the numbers are results from the model using default inputs. So at the top of this diagram, we have our standard functional unit of one megagram, or a thousand kilograms, of waste mass entering the AD facility. The first thing that mass sees upon entering the facility is a, a screening mechanism that is intended to remove contaminants. And there's a certain amount of residual from that that uh, then leaves the AD facility and is sent to a, uh, a landfill or other treatment process as defined in the larger waste system. The materials passing the screen go into a mixer where uh, water is potentially added to meet the, the target moisture content that we have defined for this reactor. Now in the reactor, uh, this is what I described as um, we're modeling it in a, from a black box point of view, uh, meaning that we have performance data for uh, what's going on inside that reactor. We're not explicitly modeling the biochemistry that's going on. But in any case, we have biogas output from the reactor, and we have digestate, which is the liquid and solid components um, coming out of the digester. In this default setup, the digestate is going to a dewatering step. From there, the, um, the dewatered solids continue down while some of the water is recycled back into the reactor and some of it is sent to a wastewater facility. Um, in this case, it's defined as being off-site, but you could set that to be on-site as well. And the dewatered solids continue down to a curing phase in the default setup. And this is uh, similar to the curing phase in a composting operation where the, uh, the digested solids are allowed to sit there and um, there's some off gases we see, uh, that's some carbon dioxide and some water vapor leaving those digested solids. After a predefined curing time, the the material goes to a post-screening process uh, just for further refinement and ultimately we're left with a finished compost-like product at the end. So what are we going to do with the biogas? The primary objective, as we discussed before, of AD is energy recovery. There's methane in biogas. Methane is essentially natural gas, good heating value at that and you can uh, burn methane in an engine or in a, potentially in a turbine and use the electricity that you produce uh, to offset conventional production. Other things you could do are upgrade biogas to natural gas quality and put it into a pipeline or you could uh, compress it and use it as vehicle fuel. In S-Wolf, we, um, we calculate biogas production using material specific methane potential which I discussed already and uh, then we also estimate a percent of that methane potential that's reached in the modeled system. Uh, those estimates are based on uh, lab measured decay rates and so we uh, from the decay rates estimate uh, whether 100% is produced or maybe only 50% um, we have default values for that in the model. So uh, our default setup, we send that biogas to an engine for uh, combustion and electricity production that's based on the heating value of methane and the heat rate for a, an engine turbine system. It considers system downtime, some leakage, and we're offsetting electricity generation from a chosen grid. The other uses I mentioned, upgrading the biogas for pipeline or for vehicle fuel, we don't yet model those things in S-Wolf. Some key inputs would be the heat rate for the engine, the facility use of electricity, meaning um, electricity that's required for pumps, lighting, etc, etc. Um, and that's a, that's a key factor when we net those uh, electricity production and use Digestate management. So as we mentioned before, there's nutrient value depending on the feedstocks coming in. 
uh, you, there's a certain amount of nutrient value coming through uh, the digestion process and um, we can use that potentially in place of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, mineral fertilizers. Um, there's potential also to use the digestate, uh, cured digestate solids as a soil conditioner or soil amendment, um, possibly improving the quality of that soil through its moisture holding capacity, for example, which is a little bit difficult to, difficult to quantify. Uh, another possible benefit would be um, using a cured digestate solid as a specialty soil need, uh, replacing peat, for example, as a potting soil product. One of the bigger beneficial uses is the carbon storage benefit. Um, and this is you're taking biogenic carbon, organic matter, and um, taking the, the digested solids uh, where you have stable carbon in the solids, uh, land applying that, and, it's, and that carbon is bound in the soil for, for years. You get a climate change benefit from that. So how does this... Uh, how does this actually work? You can directly land apply what comes out of the digester with no separation. Or you can separate, um, land apply the solids, or cure the solids, and then land apply or dry the solids in some specialty circumstances. The liquids, meanwhile, would go to wastewater treatment. In S-Wolf, the way we handle that is um, when you're land applying or curing in the land applying, you get a carbon storage benefit and you choose between a fertilizer or peat production benefit, um, or offset rather. Emissions are counted for all steps, um, land application, separation, the wastewater treatment, all, all, these, um, all these steps have emissions associated with them and they're all calculated in this process model. In this table we see some of the key uh, model inputs when it comes to beneficial use of digestate. At the top there's diesel use associated with land application, slightly different between uh, directly land applying the digestate versus running the um, running it through a uh, separation and then curing phase first. Then next we have a few inputs related to carbon storage. Um, the first one indicates that 10% of the carbon remains after 100 years. So that means that of the stabilized organic carbon in the compost, 10% of that is assumed to still be bound in the soil after 100 years. So we count the climate change benefit of that 10%. And um, there's another factor here that has to do with the uh, additional carbon sequestration due to uh, adding some carbon to the soil uh, that causes more carbon to be sequestered from the atmosphere um, and that's a, a value of about 19 percent. And uh, finally we have some some items related to the nitrogen. Uh, critically we're looking at nitrous oxide uh, that's a, an important greenhouse gas. And finally, the nitrogen mineral fertilizer equivalent uh, basically sets up a ratio for our uh, mineral fertilizer offsets. So here we have uh, some emission factors for offsets. Um, we have four comps here for nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and peat um, when we're offsetting mineral fertilizer production uh, for example for nitrogen uh, for every kilogram nitrogen that we're offsetting we are saying that we're offsetting just about five kilograms of CO2 emissions. And some quick results. Um, this we're looking at uh, two different digestate management strategies the separation followed by curing and then land application uh, on the left on the right we have direct land application of the digested material the digestate and our metric here is global warming potential the the zero 
horizontal zero axis. Uh, everything on top of that represents an emission. Everything below represents an offset. Um, the net, as you can see in both cases, is a, a net global warming benefit. Um, so the, the primary emissions are related to plant operations and off gases from the digestate. Uh, they're a little bit different. Uh, the, the main thing that's different here is the direct land application requires a little bit less from the plant uh, in terms of electricity use, so those emissions are lower. On, uh, on the offset side, we can see that um, the, the nutrient content doesn't change, the soil carbon storage uh, is about the same, and your electricity offset, that's upstream of your digestate management in, in this process model, so that's constant across the two systems. So we saw in the previous figure that uh, the electricity offset was the largest component, so um, here we're looking at some different options here in terms of those electricity offsets and the impact that has on the overall system. Uh, so on the left we have a national average grid that we're offsetting. In the middle we have a high carbon, uh, maybe a coal dominated um, electricity grid that we're offsetting versus on the right side we have a low carbon grid that's maybe more nuclear or hydro. And uh, as you can see that um, that has a pretty big effect on on the net global warming potential with um, with the same system configuration. This figure shows methane yields uh, for four different system configurations and in this case we're showing um, the blue bars represent our model results and the red uh, dashes represent reported results. So remember that uh, in our model the methane yields or uh, methane production is a function of the composition and um, the ultimate methane yields per waste component and the percent of that ultimate yield that is reached. So in this case um, this is a preliminary analysis using our uh, defaults and um, we we came closer than uh, in, in some configurations we came closer than others um, but in all cases we're on the right order of magnitude and um, I'll stress that these uh, these model results did not involve any tuning to the the methane yields the the ultimate yields or to the percent of methane yields reached and um, it it was loosely based on on compositions so uh, with with some some tuning we would expect these model results to converge uh, relatively closely to the reported empirical results that's about all I have for today and here are some references um, for some of our input values and uh, these are references for um, the the methane yield values. Thank you.